It's an honor and a privilege to be here tonight in this evening in memory of the great Eleanor Roosevelt and her legacy on behalf of human rights. Eleanor Roosevelt, as has been said, was born 116 years ago today. Her mother declared she was a more wrinkled and less attractive baby than on the average. <laughs> but her father simply said she was a miracle from heaven. <coughs> and indeed she was. She was a compassionate woman who understood that the least slight or violation done to any human being was done to each of us. And she also understood that none of us is perfect and that we can only strive for perfection as individuals and as nations. Her own pacifism was sorely tested during the Second World War when she grew to believe that military force was the only way to subdue fascism. I had the good fortune of portraying Eleanor Roosevelt in a television miniseries based on Joseph Lash's Pulitzer Prize winning book Eleanor and Franklin, and it was an unmitigated pleasure to immerse myself in her life as I did for several years in the mid-1970s. Although she had died more than a decade before, her power of thought remains influential to this day, and she personally taught me through what I learned immersing myself in the role. She taught me lessons in perseverance, in overcoming shyness, in listening to others, and above all, when there are major differences of opinion, she taught me to keep the door open and to keep on talking. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is now 52 years old. It was Eleanor Roosevelt's masterpiece. She and others at the United Nations were committed to the creation of a document that would speak to all people for all times. They knew it would not be possible to achieve these basic rights soon, but they also knew that it was vital to have goals that nations and individuals could strive for. There are 30 articles in the Declaration, and I've been asked to speak about Article 19. Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Article 19 echoes, of course, the First Amendment of our own Bill of Rights and descended in part from it. The First Amendment to our United States Constitution states forcefully Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Because our First Amendment is one of the most far-reaching rights of any nation in the world, I want to concentrate on some of the problems with freedom of expression here in our own country to illustrate just how difficult the concept has been to uphold. The Bill of Rights was added as amendments to our Constitution in 1791. The citizens of the new United States, having won freedom from the monarchy of George III and fearing possible future violation of their rights, insisted on protection from their new federal government. And that is why the amendment begins, Congress shall make no law. Later amendments attempt to protect the individual similarly from state governments. The Founding Fathers were most concerned about suppression of thought in the political arena. They paid scant attention to the ramifications of free expression in the arts, for example. The 18th century was not a prudish time, and erotic literature was as much a part of a man's library, although not a woman's, I hasten to add, uh, as religious essays were. 
While many places in the world still experience daily repression of political thought, the United States now is wrestling primarily with freedom of expression and information in our arts and our media. Artists throughout history have been at the forefront of new or different ideas and often the forerunners of political suppression. One need only think of the Third Reich's parading of degenerate art in the 1930s or of the incarceration of homosexuals and artists even before the Jews or of Oscar Wilde jailed for his sexual orientation or Vaclav Havel's plays ridiculing the former repressive Czech regime or the Chinese Bur and Burmese poets silenced behind bars today. Artists are humanists. The human condition is their palette, and they more readily than most hold the mirror up to nature, exposing the underbelly of a culture. This gets them into trouble. As chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts from 1993 to 1997, I dealt with a conservative Congress under Speaker Newt Gingrich, which sought to eliminate the agency because of the artistic content of a few grants which they found to be sacrilegious, homoerotic, or salacious. The First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, but it doesn't say anything about closing an agency down which is what the 104th Congress tried to do to the National Endowment for the Arts. The Constitution is a living document, but it is not inviolable. We forget sometimes that the laws of our land are made by the men and women we elect to the House of Representatives and to the United States Senate. If those laws are challenged, they can end up in the Supreme Court, which is what happened to the NEA. Congress insisted that, quote, general standards of decency and respect for the diverse beliefs and values of the American public be considered when awarding grants, which was their way of subverting the First Amendment. The Supreme Court in a 1998 decision upheld Congress's right to the decency clause for the NEA, even though they recognized it as essentially meaningless and vague. But the court also clearly stated that any punishment of a grantee because of the content of an artwork was in violation of the First Amendment. Now this was a muddy decision. The decency clause clearly puts a chill on any organization or artist seeking funding for any controversial art. A museum might apply for Picasso's blue period for an exhibit, but hardly for his erotic drawings, for example. I wrote extensively about my time in Washington in a recent memoir that the provost cited called Command Performance, an Actress in the Theater of Politics. I'd like to read a passage about an initial meeting on the Hill to reinforce the idea that our laws are only as good as we are as a people and whom we elect to the House of Representatives and the Senate, and that mores and morals are constantly in a state of flux. You're going to fund pornography? The senator barked at me across the vast expanse of government desk, made all the more intimidating by his diminutive size. Or perhaps I was the one who was shrinking in my chair. Strom Thurmond had been South Carolina senator for 40 years. <laughs> Over and over again, he had been returned to office. He had a reputation for getting things done for his constituents, whether it was a tobacco issue or defense or a local favor. Call Strom. He'll take care of it. You're going to fund pornography? His question to me was flung out like a glove slapping the ground. I rose weakly to the challenge and responded that the National Endowment for the Arts did not fund obscenity, that obscenity was considered unprotected speech. He said he didn't care what the endowment did, he wanted to know what I thought. I said somewhat grandly that I was an artist, that as an artist nothing human was alien to me. It was a phrase that I'd pondered a lot in the past, a phrase originally attributed to the Roman playwright Terence in 350 BC. And as I said it, images of the fall of the Roman Empire conjured in my mind. 
Aren't you a moral woman? Thurman shot back. Well, that was a question no one had ever asked me. It took me by surprise and I had to think a minute. All the roles I ever played flashed before my eyes. Mothers, daughters, lovers, wives, murderers, lawyers, judges and drunks, lesbians, nurses, saints and sinners. I had to love them when I played them. I had to love something about every character and moral judgment never came into it. As for my own life, had I been guilty about things? Sure. Had there been regrets? Of course. But overall, I didn't think in absolutes. I replied, yes, I'm a moral woman. And then I began to descend the slippery slope. I felt compelled to defend the artist in me and all the artists that had ever existed, knowing full well that controversy and political expediency were entwined from time immemorial to the present day. Hadn't the Pope in the 1500s asked Michelangelo to put a fig leaf on the private parts of his statue of David? And as I write this, didn't New York's Mayor Giuliani threaten to close the Brooklyn Museum because of a painting he thought was sacrilegious? I forged ahead anyway. First Amendment rights protect free speech, I said. This elicited instantaneous disgust. The senator was almost apoplectic. Ah, he spat out. First Amendment rights are an excuse for people to do things they shouldn't be doing. <laughs> Whoops. There goes 200 years of jurisprudence, I thought. I made one last try to rescue this disastrous interview. The endowment doesn't fund pornography, I repeated. And not wishing to alienate this venerable institution of the South, the senator, any further, I beat a hasty retreat out of his office and down the marble halls of Congress. I was shaken, scared out of my wits. Was this the United States Senate? Was this what a senator of the United States actually believed? What happened to the Constitution? Hadn't all the battles been fought already by the Continental Congress when they hammered out their brilliant document on the nature of democracy and a civil society? I knew the answer in my heart. I knew these precepts had to be defended over and over again with each generation. But it was a tough first visit to the Hill. Well, what's wrong with this picture? Surely it's wrong of a United States senator to so cavalierly scrap the First Amendment. But I also, in an effort to protect my left flank, edited the First Amendment by saying obscenity was unprotected speech. This is true. Since 1957, dozens of courts, the Supreme Court included, have exempted sex in the guise of obscenity from the protection of freedom of expression. Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison are probably rolling over in their graves at the thought. And how is obscenity defined? Vaguely at best. Obscenity is called, quote, speech without redeeming social importance and which lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. It also caters to prurient interest and is patently offensive. With this kind of definition, you might be talking about two muddy dogs coupling on a picnic table. <laughs> Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart, in a landmark decision some years ago, couldn't define obscenity satisfactorily either, but said simply, I know it when I see it. And so our courts continue to wrangle with the sexual proclivities of the nation to the amusement, if not the astonishment, of some other major nations in the world who cannot understand our obsession with sex when the obscenity in their eyes might be overt violence that we flaunt so proudly in our action and horror movies. And if money makes the world go around, business empires have been built on our collective puritanical streak. As Mae West said, I believe in censorship. After all, I made a fortune out of it. <laughs> the American spirit is associated with independence and individuality, which founded our country. But that independent spirit never strayed very far from another great influence, Puritanism. 
Henry Steele Commager, writing over 50 years ago, said, the strength and persistence of fundamentalism well into the 20th century is one of the curiosities of the history of American thought. That a people so optimistic and self-confident should accept a theology which insisted on the depravity of man, that a people so distrustful of all authority should yield so readily to the authority of the scriptures as interpreted by men like themselves, all this is difficult to explain except on fundamentalist grounds. Perhaps our internal pendulums of independence and self-determinism swing so far that we need the counterweight of fundamentalism for balance. In any case, this streak of conservatism is especially alive and well in the United States today as doors close daily on provocative material in the arts and media. Just last month, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, in response to a slideshow given by the noted and award-winning photographer Sally Mann, decided its future museum programs will be given a decency litmus test by the Board of Trustees. Virginia's Governor James Gilmore declared the photographs of Mann's children lewd and simply unacceptable and demanded that the museum draft policies to prevent similar displays. His main concern, he stated, was to prevent obscene material from being shown on taxpayer-funded property. Aside from the fact that almost every city museum in the country receives some kind of public funding, this is exactly the same argument that I encountered again and again from members of Congress about controversial grants awarded by the NEA. Whatever you want to do with private funds, is fine, they would say, just not with taxpayers' money. Just as we have to ask whose standards of decency when making judgments about things like obscenity or decency, so we must ask which taxpayers? The answer, of course, is that we are all taxpayers in America, rich and poor, young and old, black and white, gay and straight, progressive and conservative. We are as diverse as the rainbow of human experience. A democracy celebrates all of its citizens, protecting any minority from the tyranny of a, major of a majority. And that is what the First Amendment is really all about. It not only allows freedom of expression for the loneliest, or the most disenfranchised voice, but it celebrates it as well. And perhaps even more importantly, it gives access to all citizens to the ideas of other people. Oliver Wendell Holmes was one of the most cogent justices to articulate the value of free expression to society. He spoke of the marketplace of ideas as strengthening society through counterforce. In other words, when fascistic or abhorrent ideas are disseminated freely, they give rise to opposing ideas which educated men and women dedicated to an ultimate good will willingly adopt. Oliver Wendell Holmes died in 1935, never witnessing the horrors perpetrated by Adolf Hitler a few years later. But his philosophy was echoed by the young Anne Frank before she perished. I still believe that people are really good at heart. It took more than the counterforce of ideas, of course, to vanquish Hitler. It took the unshakable faith of millions of men and women who knew he was wrong and who were willing to die for that belief. Holmes might say that the ultimate good triumphed after all, but what a price to pay. And this brings us to the next important element of freedom of expression. Speech is not protected by the First Amendment when it elicits a clear and present danger. Holmes, again, with Justice Louis Brandeis, evolved this concept during World War I. Holmes used shouting in a, a fire in a crowded theater as an example of language that could cause panic and possible injury. As amorphous as the definitions of clear 
and present and even danger are, the concept has expanded to include speech which is harmful to minors, speech which incites violence, and speech which threatens national security. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, goes the old adage. The courts have determined that words do indeed hurt some people some of the time and that they can represent a clear and present danger. In addition, of course, to the spoken word, some writing, symbols, and demonstrations are also included and may constitute that clear and present danger. An Oregon court recently decided that an anti-abortion group had incited violence through its website, ultimately leading to the murder of a doctor who performed abortions. Millions of documents are, quote, classified by the federal government, kept secret from the people because their publication might breach national security. The Central Intelligence Agency has tried for years to make it a crime to leak classified information, and they may get their way if a current bill is passed by the Senate and, and is made law. This means that we as citizens could have no robust debate about our nation's involvement in other countries. We won't even know the extent of that involvement as we did not know until recently of the extent of our involvement in places like Chile or Guatemala. The access of all citizens to ideas and information is one of the first basic tenets of the First Amendment. The decision about the anti-abortion website is interesting. The internet is going to be facing a host of court decisions in the decades to come. When speech is made in a public venue such as a park or in the streets or on a public access cable channel, it receives protection under the First Amendment precisely because the space belongs to the people. Is the internet a public space? Most people would say that it is. However, in order to enter that space, I am often assaulted by images and advertisements that I don't solicit and that block me from getting to my destination unless I firmly push no. Is this a violation of my private property, my screen, which is also sacrosanct under the First Amendment, private property? And what on the net might be considered harmful to minors? Marketing of child pornography, yes, but what about the photographs of Sally Mann? The internet opens a Pandora's box of new thoughts about freedom of expression. Hurtling through cyberspace right now are thousands of ideas and billions of pieces of information with the ability to increase exponentially. This is new to mankind. No longer do we make the trip or have to make the trip to our corner store to buy that one newspaper or book or turn on our television at an appointed time for the news or collect our mail from a box once a day. The effort and the desire to do that, to go out and get that information have been minimized. Now we have instant access, instant gratification, if you can get online, <laughs> and instant replication. And there are few monitors so far. Often we have no idea who is sending the message or who is behind the website, so where is accountability? Yes, the internet may be free, but it is, is it truthful? How do we discern what is fact or fiction? A hundred years ago, a photograph was considered the ultimate truth, capturing as it did a moment in time. Today, a photograph a film or a tape may be a compilation of lies composed of images to suit the agenda of its maker. Hoaxes and rumors will be rampant on the net. Some of you may have heard of a current one which says that Congress is considering a five cent tax on every email to cover the deficit of the U.S. Post Office. <laughs> there is no such bill, but it roused a lot of angry response. Too many such hoaxes and pretty soon people will cry wolf and not respond to the real thing. In the 1930s, Orson Welles' radio show, The War of the Worlds, caused real panic among listeners who thought we were being invaded from outer space. How will we know what is invented or what is fact on the internet? We can expect untold lawsuits in the future based on libel, invasion of privacy, copyright infringement, what Napster's going through now. 
obscenity, incitement to violence, and crimes that have yet to be named. The good news is that the net gives us a plethora of ideas and information that will be immensely useful and educative. Home's marketplace of ideas has never been stronger, and that marketplace is now global thanks to technology. People everywhere will be introduced to viewpoints they may never have encountered before, and this access to new ideas is the bedrock of freedom of expression and must be preserved at all costs. Some governments will seek to suppress antithetical thought, but unless they deny citizens access to the internet altogether, it is unlikely that they're going to succeed. And so it is a brave new world that we enter in the year 2000. A world Eleanor Roosevelt only dreamed of when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was drafted. We still have a long way to go. In the United States, controversy is bound to erupt again and again as the citizens of our pluralistic society ask to be seen and heard in all the venues hitherto dominated by a white Christian male ethic and by moneyed interests. But democracy embraces everyone, not just a privileged few and not just those whose voices espouse one viewpoint. We might as well get used to the controversy that occurs when cultures collide and welcome the discussion that it engenders rather than repudiate the intrusion. As Eleanor Roosevelt would say, in the finest tradition of free speech, just keep talking. Thank you.